it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marcia Bundy Sieber. Thank you very much. Pleasure to join you today. And we're on spring break, so I know how to party. Uh, like, <laughs> like, like my students, they're all out uh, uh, who know, who know, doing who knows what, and I'm delighted to spend part of my spring break uh, here with you. Ah, been hearing from uh, Deborah Spoboda a bit about your journey uh, in uh, curriculum transformation, and I'm delighted to be coming uh, here in the middle of that. Uh, from some of what she's told you there, I share with m probably many of you uh, a journey that's taken me from a disciplinary home, disciplinary degrees, into interdisciplinary studies. Uh, there are increasingly degrees in both interdisciplinary fields and in a new field of interdisciplinary studies itself. Uh, does anyone here have a, a degree in either of those, an interdisciplinary field like uh, environmental studies or a degree in IDS, interdisciplinary studies? Okay, well then we, we do share that in common, that our journey is taking us from disciplinary homes uh, into this new territory. Uh, my journey, uh, just uh, in brief from what she has said, started back in the 80s, early 90s, when I was invited to become a member of a teaching team. I was the literature person on a team with an art historian and a music historian teaching a course in Romanticism in the arts. So uh, over many, many years, uh, enjoyed that teaching team and learned a huge amount uh, from doing that, uh, then moved into directing the program. I'm now back in my main disciplinary hat, but uh, continue to uh, do, a lot, do a lot with the interdisciplinary program. So I guess I'm living proof that, I can, uh, that it is possible to, uh, not to choose one or the other of those, but to, uh, to enjoy and learn from, uh, from doing both. Uh, just, for the, just for the record, my program uh, shares, as I was looking at your plan, a possible plan, a number of things, uh, a number of characteristics uh, with your program. Uh, see if I could take you into a uh, slide of ours, and if you are interested in a description, uh, the end of your packet has a uh, program description of it. The program that we put in in the uh, 80s, actually, late 80s, had all students taking uh, courses in areas outside their major. They could choose a course in four of those five areas, in the areas furthest from their major. Every course needed to designate one of these at least, and at least one additional kind of skill for lifelong learning, and all of the courses needed to incorporate active learning. So as, I, as I'm reading your program, I'm seeing that there are a number of common characteristics there in what we tried to do and what you are aiming for here. Uh, just for the record, my institution, I think, has a few things in common with Queens. We're both mid-size. We both uh, combine liberal arts and sciences with a business school, with health professions, and so on. In addition, we have a college of education, a music conservatory, an art conservatory, an engineering and technology school, and so on. So we have actually seven schools with a student body smaller than yours, a bit smaller than, uh, than yours. So trying to bring together that many different kinds of faculty into a common gen ed program that goes across all the baccalaureate programs, whether you're uh, going to be an opera singer or an engineer, was a part of our challenge because all the schools had to agree to that kind of, of combination. Things are different for you now, though, than they were uh, when we designed our program. And there's uh, a phrase that uh, one of my colleagues uh, has said uh, that I've enjoyed uh, and used over the years. He says, you know, when we started, it was interdisciplinarity by accident. We didn't really know what we were doing. We just got together and threw some things together that we thought went well together and hoped that the students would somehow get it. Uh, there's a book on interdisciplinary team teaching by James Davis. Uh, I don't know if you know that book or not. It's, uh, it's a nice one, a collection of case studies and uh, data on team teaching. And he comments that you're always inventing the subject in this kind of curriculum. Um, so uh, it's, it's just in, in the nature of the, uh, of the challenge. That's where we started. For you, you have the advantage of a larger and deeper national conversation. Uh, AACNU and its enterprises is one example of that. There was just a conference on integrative learning and there's a National Professional Association now that's been in existence for some time but has expanded its activities uh, a good deal so that you've got a national network of support and as a growing literature. Uh, the literature was coming when we started but it was hard to find. It was dispersed across literatures of separate disciplines. 
There was not really any centralized way to locate it. There weren't good bibliographies available. And that does exist now so that you're not working in as much of a vacuum uh, to do it. And you've got the AAC and you uh, and its resources uh, behind you. For me, two things that are different that help me a lot in my work with faculty uh, are these. I'm a sucker for one pagers. Faculty say to me, what is it I'm trying to do again? That's, how is a disciplinary syllabus different from an interdisciplinary syllabus? I'm a sucker for a one pager. Uh, Association for Integrative Studies has one online and you've got some of these resources listed on your handout. Just basically in one page, what are some issues that the faculty should consider when creating a course? I also work with some faculty that say, I'm sick of guidelines and rules and things that I'm supposed to be doing. Just show me, what does it look like? There used to be a box in Bill Newell's office at Miami University of Ohio where he was collecting interdisciplinary syllabi. I remember at one point going up to Bill and saying, you know, can we see that box? Uh, can we have that box? Uh, and the technology was just becoming available uh, for website development uh, at that point. And so that was a part of my contribution to the Association for Integrative Studies website was to propose that we start collecting materials electronically and peer review it. Sure, you can Google uh, your course topic, whether it's environmental studies or uh, ethics in the professions, whatever. You can Google that and come up with uh, millions of hits. What's different about this site uh, is that it would have a set of people who are used to thinking about what good interdisciplinary studies entails, peer reviewing it and posting uh, some good models. And for a lot of faculty, just pointing them to that website has made a big difference. They say, oh, well, that's not how I would do it but I can see what, the, what they're trying to do uh, and that availability of models uh, has helped uh, a great deal to just imagine um, how you could move outside of your discipline. So what I hope we can do uh, in the time today, I'm thinking perhaps I would uh, speak for a bit here, which I don't normally do in my own, I'm used to talking about a poem sitting in a circle and with the text in front of us and carrying on, but uh, talk a bit given the format of what we've got here and then uh, have do some questions and discussion and do an activity uh, at the end. But please feel free to uh, offer comments all along the way. I won't get derailed. I'd be very happy to uh, take conversation along the way. And tell me if I'm standing square in front of the PowerPoint. This is not my normal mode of operation. So if I'm doing that, just push me back. I ask uh, what kinds of questions were circulating here at York. It's hard to come in in the middle of a process uh, and speak in a way that's not what you know already or uh, not what you need uh, at this point, and uh, Deborah was kind enough to share with me some questions. And as I was looking at the array of questions, there were lots of them, thank you very much, uh, they seemed to center uh, around issues of designing, teaching, and maintaining uh, interdisciplinary gen ed. So I'll move basically in that direction uh, in the middle part of the hour today, and any slides that I've got here should be prefixed with the words, it could help to uh, as opposed to rules and guidelines. Uh, it's just not, uh, not like that. So any suggestions here are things to consider. Uh, they may sound bare bones or generic. What I hope to do is flesh them out with examples, things that we've tried, things that I saw for that syllabus website as I was serving as a peer reviewer for syllabi nationwide, and a lot of pitfalls along the way. I can claim to have contributed many of those myself uh, in the classrooms that I've taught, uh, plenty of those things that I've tried uh, that didn't work. I've seen a lot of things in the program that I've directed uh, that didn't work, and I've seen some things nationwide that didn't work. So um, try to add some pitfalls uh, along the way. So starting out here with a course planning process, uh, if you have at some point moved beyond your passage of a curriculum and you say, well, we're going to go for it. Getting in front of whatever planning group is functioning, whether it's keystone-wide, say, or whether it's topic-specific within a keystone, whatever group of faculty is going to start working on it. It really helps to get some definitions in front of that group of faculty. I understand that some of you in this room are already busy, work, would know this material already, but most faculty uh, are not used to the terminology and uh, it does help to look at it. Are you juxtaposing? Is one discipline the center and the others are providing uh, comparisons? Or 
Are you aiming for interdisciplinary? They're all fine. They're all useful. It's just the issue is sometimes you aim for one and you end up creating something other than what you're shooting for. So if it's a deliberate conscious decision of what you're aiming for, uh, it does help. The general, uh, have you, has your group seen this definition along the way? Uh, if you read, say, the handbook on the undergraduate curriculum, uh, this is claimed as a consensus definition. Uh, many would uh, come up with other kinds of definitions, but as I read book upon book on interdisciplinary studies, including our own, this is the definition that people have often come back to. Notice that it has three parts, uh, which we'll play around with later in the hour here. It's uh, answering a question, solving a problem, or addressing a topic that's too broad or complex to be dealt with by a single discipline. A part two of drawing on the disciplines. So this is not an alternative to or something other than. It's drawing on using disciplines. And then not stopping there, but going on to attempt to integrate their insights through constructing of a more comprehensive perspective. So it's that three-part definition uh, that has provided us a good anchor and nationwide is uh, providing uh, a good anchor. All that, yes, please. Uh, can you go back to I'll be happy, by the way, to put this whole PowerPoint on my website so that you could just uh, um, refer to it easily. Did you have a question about? Uh, excuse no, me. No, no, no. Just to say, yes, please. Yeah, I, I think that actually this this is uh, something that's really been a kind of point of discussion uh, here. Uh, I think that originally a lot of these courses were conceived as kind of multidisciplinary. In fact, at one point the idea was there was an idea that there were going to be modules that were taught by you know different different people who you know would never be in the same classroom together, but would, you know put together would teach the course. Right. Uh, and we sort of moved away from that model for, um, for various reasons, among them being um, just logistical. Um, uh, and I think that we're trying, you know, we, we, we say that we're aiming for interdisciplinary, but I think that, that there's a kind of anxiety that we may end up with cross-disciplinary uh, because uh, we're, in it, we're going to be having people, now just one, one instructor uh, teaching uh, but, but supposed to be incorporating different disciplines, but obviously that instructor is going to be more comfortable with one. With one. Amen to everything that you just said, and that's, uh, uh, I can give you tons of examples uh, of that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, interdisciplinarity is the word nationwide, from AAC and U, and integrative learning is one of their rubrics for uh, judging learning and so on, and integration is, is the way to go according to uh, the national best practices these days. My university, uh, is, is, I can show you examples, and from the AIS website uh, submissions, uh, plenty of examples. Uh, the cross-disciplinarity is really frequent. You basically operate out of your home discipline if you're gonna do it by yourself. You claim that you're gonna really get that full integration, but you make some forays. Mm -hmm maybe a week or two tacked on at the end. I have a colleague who teaches Greek literature and he has an art week. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he brings in a guest and he does an art week. Uh, or a literature person who stays in literature and draws some comparisons. Oh, and here's some paintings for comparison. But basically you're grounded in your home discipline, both feet planted there, and little, little forays, either sporadic along the way or in a gesture uh, uh, at the end. And we saw plenty of those, people turning in syllabus, syllabi for the nationwide website that were that, exactly that. They were disciplinary courses that showed awareness of connections, but they were not true interdisciplinary courses. They were disciplinary courses with their eyes open. Uh, and then, of course, as you're saying also, uh, we saw plenty of syllabi that were basically mini courses. Mini course A glued on to mini course B glued on to mini course C. And as far as we could tell from the assignments that faculty had sent, the assignments were assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, each disciplinary assignment glued together. And if there was an assignment at the end, it was, what do you make of it all? Good luck, be creative. And you know what you get there, uh, nothing terribly good, uh, except for those bursts of spontaneity of wonderful students who can do that mixing themselves with no help, uh, no coaching, but uh, uh, that is, um, that is an issue. 
So a part of where we've got to go today is this, uh, what are some ways, that's what I'm hoping to talk about here, what are some ways to make that happen? I, I think also it, it would probably be a process for individuals as we engage in this because you know, there's this certain tension in academia, as you're pointing to, between our training, which is so discipline specific, and, and then to come out of that, it doesn't happen over nothing. Right. It, it's, a, it's a gradual process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but I like what you just said about keeping the eyes open, because that's, that's the key, I think, mm. to, it, to mm. look at it in a different way. Mm. So basically, that, that sets the agenda for the rest of where we're going in this workshop is uh, how, how do you help it uh, to happen more fully? If you want integration, how do you help that to happen uh, with any uh, greater uh, frequency? One thing we found helpful is to get the di disciplinary perspectives uh, explicit at the beginning. What's going to be essential to the course? And some definitions that can help you there. Are you going to look at interdisciplinarity across sciences, in other words, within a knowledge domain of scientific disciplines, or are you going to combine sciences and ethics, for example? What's essential? If you had multi-sectioned courses, to what extent could that be individualized? Sample. Uh, we're just putting through now a science and art class that's going to look at uh, issues across our liberal arts and sciences, sciences faculty, and our art conservatory. But sometimes a, sci uh, a chemist is going to be available, sometimes a physicist. But the only way we're going to get that course approved is that we're going to have genuine sciences labs. That's going to be, without that, the course won't happen. It's going to have sciences labs and then someone from the art school. But it could be a painter. It could be someone working in ceramics. The specific disciplines can vary. But the course that I'm working on right now to get approved, is going to, it's going to have to cross sciences, a science, and a, an art uh, discipline. But for local proposals and national proposals, we've seen a lot of faculty move into this kind of discipline by basically er trying to erase the disciplines. Uh, a person at my school teaches sources of power, and she has said her goal is to make the disciplines invisible. So she basically moves from reading A to reading B to reading C, but the students don't have any awareness of what disciplines they're operating out of. Uh, that's things that we've seen nationally. Reading is about race, reading is about the Holocaust, just a lot of stuff, but no awareness of disciplinary lenses. I was pleased to see in your proposal that being aware of disciplinary lenses was one of the things that you uh, would have happen here, which I think is a, a great move. Uh, the intent uh, should not be to um, become a-disciplinary, non-disciplinary, but to draw on disciplines, back to that uh, originating definition uh, again. Not, not ignore them in other words, to, but to use those lenses. I'm aware from Deborah that uh, there are issues of, of delivery here. I guess my strong urge is that uh, a team develops individual courses, whether or not those individual courses are going to be team taught or not. At my school, that's the only way you can get a course into the gen ed program, is to have a team of faculty bring it forward. I just sat around a, a faculty senate table with the scientist and the uh, artist sitting side by side, uh, putting it through. Without that, the course would not have been approved. One person can't do it. You may or may not want to go that, that way. Uh, but for us, we're aiming at common topics of conversation. So we want multi-sectioned courses where faculty are talking with each other ongoing. Not just launching a program, but talking with each other ongoing. And students are talking about some common topics. One of our courses is epidemics and AIDS. We wanted students across the many schools of the university to be in the lunchroom and have some things that they could talk about beyond uh, the typical uh, student uh, conversations. This has been huge for us regardless of the delivery program. When I started in my romanticism class, I knew I wanted to send students to our art museum. We have the uh, uh, Wadsworth Athenaeum in downtown Hartford. We knew we wanted to send our students there. I could have made up an observation assignment, but it wouldn't have been very good. Or I could have worked on it a really long time, but I was working directly with an art historian. She said, oh, here's a great museum assignment to help students to see well. Use it. So we freely, freely uh, lift from each other. I shared with her one of my listening to voices assignment on approaching poetry without trying to figure out what it all means, but to just hear voices. We team taught so we could do that constantly. 
At the moment, the course is not team taught, but there's a course portfolio. So new faculty come in, and we've got all this stuff that we sort of pass on to uh, incoming faculty so that you have the disciplinary integrity of direct work with someone who's in that unfamiliar discipline. <coughs> so to me, that is huge, not just when you're thrashing out getting something approved campus-wide, but that you'd be able to do that ongoing. Pitfall on this, then, is to start out with the collaboration and then let it go. And then everybody goes off and their own separate little thing, and then back to, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, your comment earlier, yeah, but then we all just go back. You know, we collaborate for a while, we get the curriculum passed, we get the course passed, and then we just go back and do what we've always done with a little tweaking uh, along the edges, which is not the kind of radical change I think that you're after, nor is it what we were after. In terms of the uh, collaborative faculty design of these courses, which you know, I agree with you absolutely, is it institutionalized on your campus, or is it an informal process? The in approval words, process? In other words, is there, because we've been working about, uh, we've been working towards bringing our ideas into more, you know, let's say concrete realization. So do you have um, a division on campus that organizes this? Do faculty just on their own sit down and design a course? Do, is there some kind of institutional support for this process? It sounds similar to what I saw in your document here. In other words, we have uh, an all-university curriculum director, mm -hmm. which I was for a while, and now I'm doing <coughs> faculty development uh, with that person. There's a committee of representatives across the school, and course creation comes both top-down and bottom-up. Mm -hmm. Sample. Uh, we wanted a course on leadership that was going to be a learning community with a leadership floor in one of our dorms. We had a faculty member in the business school who taught in marketing department, someone in communication, someone in educational leadership, uh, someone else in communication. We had faculty who didn't even know each other working across our comprehensive school. So that was a part of what I did was to go around and talk to all these different people, get them together in a room. It was really quite wonderful, but it would not have happened if somebody hadn't brought them together to create the course. A lot of times it bubbles up from a lunch table like yours where this person says, I want to do ethnic roots and urban arts. And person B says, I do too, but it's not my field, but let's, oh, wouldn't that be fun? And out of the lunchroom, some of the best and longest lasting courses have come out of the lunchroom. So uh, it, it, it can work both ways, but there's a, we do have a centralized committee that would approve, and then it goes on to a university-wide faculty senate uh, approval process. But uh, everything has to come through this inter interdisciplinary uh, gen ed committee uh, first. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Further in the actual uh, design uh, of a course, a key point that we found uh, that uh, amuses me because we know better and we have a problem with it anyway, uh, and that is that you've got to let go of the coverage model. These courses are not surveys of. So you're not doing a survey of British literature and art and music all squished together in one course. And we know this. Uh, here's an example of one of our leadership faculty. He chairs the faculty senate He's an education faculty member, and he's done interdisciplinary teaching for decades. We just had a meeting taking a course from special topics to permanent. We said, hey, how did it go? He said, it was really fun. Oh my god, we did too much. <laughs> we tried to do too much. Nothing. If he doesn't know better, <laughs> he knows better. Uh, my own, my god, you don't let go of Beethoven, and you don't let go of Goya, <laughs> and you don't let go of, by the time we put all of our favorites together, we had too much. So each time, each of our teams, I see it happening over and over again, uh, to do a good course, we have to let go and give it time. Julie Thompson Klein has a diagram that uh, faculty have found uh, useful over a lot of years. She actually presented this at my university some years ago. We're used to a two-part pull of depth and breadth in terms of how much you put in. If you're really going to try to do any integration, uh, allowing time for that to happen um, as well uh, matters. Ongoing with issues of course design, beyond keystone focuses for a particular iteration of a keystone course, what kind of focusing questions would grab students, would give a genuine push to, uh, to the course? You know, is it how, how can we uh, ameliorate world hunger? Uh, is it how can we make people act on what they know about safe sex uh, in an age, uh, age of 
uh, aids uh, in the arts, uh, issues of arts reflecting culture. Uh, you know, how, how do they reflect it? Do they create it? I'm sure, you know it's both, but it's something that's going to snag the students in a question form uh, has been helpful for us. Having the faculty team hash out terms can be more complicated than you think, but key to interdisciplinary process. Trying to figure out, do we share terminology across the disciplines in this course planning group, or do we differ? In my own group, we realized that we were all talking about classicism, but it means something completely different in art and music and literature, even different time periods. Uh, neoclassical in music is not the same time period as it is in art. No wonder our <coughs> students were getting confused when we started. So we ended up actually in a self-published text making a glossary for ourselves and for students. When you say this word in your discipline, what does it mean? Is it the same thing I mean? And that's going to be obviously different for uh, whatever disciplines you're putting together. But uh, we've now got that right out there uh, for students. And it's taken us some time, uh, but it's made the course uh, a lot clearer. With the discipline crossing concepts, we started with too much. Ended up realizing that in a semester, if we could even nail three of them, we ended up with revolutions in art and life and nature in the heart and mind and individualism and its costs for a romanticism class. Uh, having those as common threads weaving their way through the course and even organizing the course later on made a big difference for us. We started doing it and we each just had so many concepts across the disciplines, there was no way that the students could find any territory for integration because we were doing so many different things. So can we agree? And again, this can be done in uh, workshops with planning groups of faculty. Uh, what are some central concepts um, that, would, that would really help? What skills, both discipline specific and discipline crossing? our epidemics and AIDS class. They wanted students to be able to write a lab report. It's an intro science class. It counts as a lab science. But they also wanted students to be able to take what they knew about science and do a public health campaign to convey some of this, uh, communicate some of this knowledge to some students in uh, high school in Hartford. So uh, the issue uh, for me here is that you don't just accumulate skills from individual disciplines and glue them together in a course plan but that some of your skills cross disciplines. And then, of course, learning activities that would build uh, those. And we'll try a little bit of that at the end of the hour uh, today with a discipline crossing concept or skill and how would you build it. I was delighted, by the way, to see that you have a backward design workshop coming up uh, shortly here uh, in, this, uh, in this sequence. It works great with interdisciplinary studies because you think about what are you trying to accomplish and then you back up into how am I going to get students to do that? Um, well. And we'll try, we'll try that a bit. In materials for students, my big uh, line here is simply across the screen, be specific, be explicit, spell it out. We started teaching interdisciplinary courses, and faculty can't even agree on what interdisciplinary means. How do you think the students feel walking in the door? They don't know what it is. They don't know why the method of delivery it doesn't look like Math 101, English 101. They don't know why you're doing what you're doing. So we, we have a longer little intro blurb, sort of a, a, a cell at the beginning. Uh, not all the multi cross disciplinary stuff, but some kind of a cell of why would you take an interdisciplinary approach for this topic? It's not going to just be three times the complications. It's going to be maybe three times, three lenses that are going to show you more than you saw before. We try to change the metaphor. It's not just add it all together and it's going to be three times as hard. But there's going to be three, maybe th two or three spotlights where you're going to see more than you would have seen otherwise on this topic. So that uh, uh, spelling that out uh, has helped. And we spell out if we have overarching goals like values identification or written communication, we spell out a little bit how that's going to work out in this course so that students along the way don't say, oh, but this is just gen ed and this is just arts class, why am I doing all this writing again? So we put all that up, all uh, top loaded into, in, into the syllabus to uh, let them see a little bit what are they going to get out of it that's going to help them in their majors on into their, uh, into their lives. Uh, the most complicated of these three is the storyline uh, and making that clear. Uh, Bill Newell, who has consulted hundreds of times uh, out of Miami of Ohio, 
uh, has commented, uh, see if I can uh, snag his quote here, even the very best interdisciplinary courses face the problem of making the logic of the course apparent to students. Even the best of the courses. We were reviewing syllabi coming in nationwide for the website and basically it just looked like a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. But there was no road map through the stuff to figure out where it was going. And sure, uh, that can emerge as you do it. And we teaching romanticism, we didn't want to box in Beethoven. We didn't want to make him fit into any little uh, box on the syllabus. Uh, we wanted uh, the juxtapositions to emerge. Whatever we set side by side with something else, it, like a kaleidoscope, it showed us something new. We were having a lot of fun. The students were saying, well, couldn't we just do all the art at once <laughs> and be done with it? And then we couldn't we just put all the music in the middle and do it all at once? Uh, they were, in their course evaluations, pushing for mini courses themselves. So what we've done more recently is to give some subheadings in a syllabus. And yes, everything is going to cross uh, over. Uh, Beethoven doesn't fit in a box and all that. Uh, but we've given the students at least one route through the syllabus, uh, and it's helped a lot. And the ones that we posted online have that kind of visible <coughs> route, assuming that synergies and spontaneity will flourish and all kinds of discoveries will happen, but uh, not just a syllabus that looks like basically one damn thing after another, and that's uh, a danger of interdisciplinary syllabi, that you just have uh, that kind of undifferentiated mass. And sometimes, like a sports swing, it takes a while. You work hard to get to simplicity. Our forensics team that I was working with, they were saying, well, where should we, if we're going to integrate all this, where should we put the hard science? Uh, should we put it at the end after they bought into it and they're into the course? Should we put it at the beginning so they know it isn't just CSI, you know, <laughs> cool, uh, exciting, uh, it's going to be hard lab science? Should we put it in the middle to sort of sandwich it in? We spent hours of that. Eventually, we ended up with a subtitle of a course and a route through it that was from crime scene to courtroom. I had a legal studies person, a chemist, and a state trooper around the table. And all of a sudden, once they saw it, they said, oh, of course, from crime scene to courtroom. And it's a natural issue that the hard science is going to come in all along the way within that natural organic progression, figured out course specific. So a part of the challenge of designing these courses is to find out where those organic connections come and where that organic uh, storyline uh, uh, would be. Uh, as, as I'm looking at the clock, uh, I have had a lot to say about kinds of assignments uh, for students. And I'm thinking that if I uh, run through them all here today, I'm going to be way beyond my time. So uh, I do have the article on my website that you could uh, check out. It gives you a list of sample kinds of assignments that would get students to do uh, integrative <coughs> thinking. Uh, oh dear, now why did it do that? I don't like this to do that. Ah. Ah. Okay. Um, take just one example. Uh, reconstrual, getting students to reconstrue what they've learned already in the light of something new. I'll give one short example. There was a creativity course, and the artist coming in says you can use three shapes in your design. Students got all upset. They said, this is a creativity in the arts class. Don't give me rules. Why are you giving me rules? I want to be creative and do whatever I want. The artist said, no, three shapes. That's it. Students got angry, wrote about it in their journals. Uh, this emerged, ultimately, in a wonderful discussion of the role of the productive tension between structure and <coughs> spontaneity in the arts. Then they went back and wrote about any ways in which limits played a role in earlier workshops. So they were working in art. Then they sort of resaw what they had done in music and poetry writing through that lens of what they were learning now. So it was an assignment where you re-see through a shared con uh, concept in that case of limits. Lots of other things you can do, which I won't uh, take time uh, to do. I have a business colleague who teaches a history course where he uses uh, a choreographed case study straight out of the business school. Gives the students information about data points for a decision in American history and does a straight business school case method with it. Have another faculty member who's not a 
uh, business faculty who sends the students to a museum of political life and has the students construct a dialogue between figures in two different areas of pub public life uh, out of different materials that they've looked at in the Museum of Political History and so on. So other kinds of things that you can do to get, get different voices into students' heads are have them interview people from different arenas of public life. If the issue is why Hartford schools are so bad, we keep ending up on the bottom of national lists. Uh, have them interview two different people with different perspectives on that, disciplinary perspectives on that, and uh, have those voices in their ears as they try to uh, understand uh, more deeply and so on. Lots more to say there, but I'll uh, cut that part short. Sequences of assignments are, of course, great. We know this from good practice. You know, you have them understand discipline A, understand discipline B a bit, compare and contrast, and then apply them both to solve a problem. That's glorious. A little spiraling is also good. Uh, and a little combining along the way uh, is good. In my class, we try to start the integration from day one from absolute uh, day one. We tried to do the sequential. Had a colleague go in and start describing chord progressions in Beethoven and first movement form for sonatas. The students were literally trying to walk out the door. There's a role for you. Interdisciplinary teacher as exit blocker. I was standing at the back door. This isn't my kind of music, and they're trying to make it out the back door. Uh, next semester, he had them sing Yankee Doodle, and then he sang the Marseillaise and what differences do you hear across those two? And then we started comparing some portraits, self-portraits of uh, artists during the same time period. And they were doing comparative thinking across the arts from day one. So I guess uh, my issue is uh, it's, uh, you, you find your own creative tension as an instructor. Uh, sequences are great, but <coughs> straight sequences in interdisciplinary studies, may, uh, you may lose a lot of your students uh, along the way who don't want to take that kind of a journey. Uh, it's fun to get them a hook early on and have them start thinking across disciplines from the first day, from the very first day of class. <coughs> Coaching the process. Uh, coaching is my main metaphor for teaching anyway, and uh, doing it, uh, you can't model it in class and expect that it will happen. Whatever kind of integration you're hoping for that will not just be juxtaposing A and B and hoping that some sparks fly, whatever you expect, uh, it helps to coach along the way. That means lots of short writings rather than <coughs> term papers. It means lots of conferences. It means lots of pushing of how does this connect to that. Uh, but the more you coach, um, uh, the, the way better uh, it, does, uh, it does get. Jonathan Z. Smith, whom I don't know, has a wonderful quote. Uh, Students should not be expected to integrate anything that the faculty either can't or won't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, you, you can't uh, just you know, include the material and expect that the students will uh, somehow uh, end up with wonderful solutions that will, that will cross disciplines. Models, I know that my team needs to do better on. Uh, Blackboard is going to help. We're collecting student writings, and you can post uh, electronically. I don't know if you use WebCT. Do you use any of those uh, course management software? Blackboard. Blackboard, Blackboard. yeah, yeah. which uh, lets you uh, get some models up there. What, what would it look like to do this kind of thinking? If you want me to deal with the problem of Hartford's failing schools from multiple disciplinary perspectives, what would that look like? All of our textbooks show what a lab report looks like, what a poetry analysis looks like. But you, it, we're you know, looking at um, articles in newspapers. We're looking at task force reports uh, for examples of that discipline crossing thinking so that you can say, OK, to students, just like we need models of what syllabi look like, here's what it would look like to try to deal with the problems in the schools from those multiple perspectives. Does it sometimes do that, I wonder? I don't know. I want to spend a couple minutes with faculty development, especially since you are uh, where you are uh, in the process, and talk about each of, each of these uh, just a bit. If you were able to get your curriculum enacted, uh, it would be wonderful if you could have a coordinator for each keystone or for each course within a keystone. 
and that uh, may depend on what kind of critical mass of faculty you have uh, in either of those uh, situations. But a coordinator uh, is a person who can oftentimes serve because of their passion for the subject. You don't need huge stipends uh, to have these. Uh, we don't have stipends for our coordinators. I think we did at the beginning. I don't think we are now. But that person can convene meetings, keep the faculty getting together. They can recruit new faculty to the team. If you have somebody good in the health professions, they're going to take a new colleague and say, hey, I think you'd be wonderful in this, uh, and help to bring them in so that the director is not doing all of the recruiting, that this uh, committee is not uh, responsible for doing the recruiting. Uh, coordinator can clear up confusions, uh, concerns, can get people talking. The pitfall there is just assuming that it's going to happen. Our forensics team took blessed ever to get off the ball and get together. Once they got together, it was wonderful. But now they're not getting together again. So we've structured in not only a course coordinator to make sure it keeps happening, but ongoing communication among faculty. And again, depending on your critical mass involved, you could do it across a keystone or you could do it across topics within. Um, a particular keystone. Uh, a sample, we've structured in a five-year review for all courses in this program so that they don't simply go off and become disciplinary courses. We get the faculty together, we look at the original course design. What were you going to try to do here and what's happened to it in the separate sections of the course? Share syllabi, look at someone else from a different discipline who's teaching the same course you are, see that they're doing something much better than you're doing, get their materials bring it into your own course. And again, this works whether or not it's team taught. So I'm speaking for the moment with your uh, delivery mode still uh, not 100% sure. Uh, you can do this sort of communication uh, in either mode uh, and it makes uh, a lot of sense. Just uh, if you don't have someone responsible for it, uh, it drifts a lot, a lot. So uh, that, uh, that has helped. Food helps. I was mentioning to Deborah earlier, we don't have stipends to get people together uh, and pay them an honorarium for a workshop, but we can buy them lunch sometimes, uh, as your nice uh, 10 foot long, whatever you've got back there, uh, demonstrates. So uh, getting people together, a little bit of food, and having them uh, bring their course materials with them sometimes sets up wonderful conversations that go on on email after that. Oh, I found this wonderful article in a business journal about how you can do uh, this sort of thing. Oh, that's the ethics code in your profession. You should see the ethics code that we're changing in my professions. One set of faculty teaching ethics brought together all the ethics codes of the different <coughs> professions that they came out of and made a little chart out of it. It was really pretty cool. Uh, the extent to which the ethics codes were similar or different across the professional schools. It was enlightening. Would not have happened if somebody didn't get them together to share uh, what was happening in their separate disciplines. Sitting on, in on each other's courses has been wonderful. I've done it. I've had people do it in my classes. We're so isolated. You know, we're off in our own little kingdom of teaching. I've spent a career in my own little kingdom uh, in my department. But having someone come into my class and sit there every day, wow. <laughs> Sitting in on somebody else whose methods are completely different from yours, it's been quite wonderful. Uh, if an honorarium can fund that, so much the better. Uh, sometimes just your own curiosity uh, can be the nudge there to uh, get uh, that breakdown of isolation and get people into um, each other's classrooms. A lot of our faculty, and especially in the tight economy now, are doing an awful lot, you know, shouldering committee work uh, and all the rest. So outside the world of the semester, the summer workshops have been uh, a mainstay of our program, both to create it and to sustain it. When we created it, we had a Mellon grant. That was nice. We don't have it anymore. Uh, but uh, it's been lovely to get together with the team of faculty uh, that you're working with in the summer outside of the craziness of the semester, outside of the four meetings at once on a Tuesday or Thursday. We have the same midday uh, open slot that is no longer uh, very free. Uh, but the summer lets us uh, get together and do that kind of uh, conversation. I don't want to be doing Freud in a literary analysis when I have no understanding of what's going on with Freud in psychology. <laughs> I want to be up to date in the, I don't want to be a hacker. Uh, that bothers me. So if I'm going to be crossing disciplines, I'd rather do it with somebody with me. Uh, if I have questions, if I have concerns, again, whether or not I team teach, 
if I'm working directly with that person ongoing, I run into questions, problems, I'm intrigued by this, but what should I read? The teams get together, they share readings. Each person brings one core reading, uh, whether it's forensics or whatever else, uh, that allows that conversation to, uh, to keep on going. And the workshops have been fun. I've gotten to sit on some other teams where I know nothing of the topic, uh, but it's been a delight to just be a facilitator and watch the teams, uh, watch the sparks fly. The support for conferences, uh, if, you're, uh, if your uh, finances are the way I, my universities uh, um, are at this point, uh, maybe uh, down the road, uh, but it's a big help uh, in maybe three kinds of conferences. Uh, one could be a conference uh, that would cross disciplines. If you're teaching living in the environment, go to a con an interdisciplinary conference. Not just a chemistry conference, but an interdisciplinary studies conference. Uh, a second kind could be a conference in a different discipline. My legal studies person went to a conference in forensic chemistry. Bless her heart. <laughs> she was blown away by a lot of it, but she learned what she needed to know uh, with the help of the chemist she works with. Uh, there are also conferences from AACNU and from AIS uh, that are on whole weekends on the kind of questions that you're raising. Of how do you not just juxtapose? How do you actually do the kind of integration that we hold up as ideal? How can you make that happen? And getting faculty to conferences uh, can be wonderful, but we use up our faculty development money on our home conference. So it's hard to get a person to give up their home conference. They don't want to lose their momentum. They've got to get tenure. They've got to get promotion in their own discipline. So if there's any extra nudge that can get people out, uh, that can be uh, a big help uh, as well. I'm going to wrap up with just a few uh, comments on uh, challenges and rewards for faculty and students. I saw a laugh there. And uh, yeah, it doesn't go away. <laughs> That's not a very cheerful uh, statement. It doesn't go away. I was mentioning to Deborah that um, after as many years as our program has been in existence, I do not hear resistance to interdisciplinary studies. Ongoing faculty and new faculty coming in understand uh, its importance in the workplace, in the professions, in the interdisciplines arising, neuroscience and uh, so on. I don't get resistance to gen ed. You know, I don't want to teach in that program with the other acronym. I only want to stay in my own home. I don't get that either. But if I had a nickel for every time a person said, oh, I would love to teach for you. Part of my job as director was to make sure that those faculty kept coming in. I'd love to teach for you, but if I don't do those interdisciplinary courses, we won't have a major. Got to. And if I don't do those upper level courses in the major, we won't have a major. So I'm sorry, I just can't right now. And that doesn't go away. So I saw that you've tried one way to deal with that, that this might be an entry-level course in some majors. There's tensions there. Our women's studies had issues that they wanted a more theoretical course for the entry into women's studies, whereas for the uh, gender studies for the non-major, they would have approached it differently. So there are, there are tensions there. That's not a panacea uh, by any means. But uh, you need a good negotiator. Uh, I guess my comment there is that you need the chairs with you because the chairs schedule. I schedule. <laughs> I don't want to let my folks go <laughs> because I say I need them in the, I need them in the department. Uh, it's very hard for them to do that. Uh, so uh, keeping the chairs as a part of the discussions, specifically the chairs with that scheduling authority, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and having the chairs see the syllabi that are coming through Part of what I do is to consult with chairs. We're going to have a new course. I bring the chairs in right from the beginning, even if they're not going to teach it, so that they see the syllabi as they're being developed. If they say this doesn't have disciplinary integrity, we don't, do, we don't push it. I, don't, I never push over top of chairs, just because then you're out there hanging out to dry as a gen ed director trying to uh, uh, get a course staffed, and the chair is saying, well, that's not real American history. That's something else taught by uh, those people. So if you have the chairs <laughs> looking at the syllabi as they're developed, buying into the process, you have a shot at uh, ongoing, being able to sustain it, not just get it going, but to sustain it. I think what's interesting is um, in, on our campus, we potentially have like an inverse problem <laughs> really? of that, where there are so few majors in the humanities and the arts that they're going to suddenly have to teach this stuff because their intro courses aren't, you know, for instance, in our fine arts department where there was 
three sections of drawing, two sections of painting, uh, two sections of photography, all studio courses in the fine arts department. And with the arts and humanities keystone, arts of expression keystone replacing that, suddenly all those full-time faculty or faculty members that were teaching those classes aren't going to, we're not going to be offering a, even a third of those sections because they don't have any majors. I mean, and when I mean no majors, I mean like less than 20. You know, and, and so it's going to be interesting because I think we're going to be dealing with a little bit of the inverse of that, where it's not like, oh, I need to teach my intro courses and upper level courses to keep my majors. I don't have any majors, so now I have to teach this to make sure that I'm keeping my commitment to my contracted load for teaching. I, I hear you. Yeah. I, I, what, what was in my mind is I got a couple of our big majors are psychology and communication, and it's very hard to pry any of those faculty loose. Mm -hmm. But that, that can actually... Um, if those faculty like the courses, if they help to design them, if they, if they think that the courses have the integrity that they want. Um, we're the same way with philosophy. We don't have philosophy majors, basically. Very, very few. I could count them. Yeah, uh, but, but then ethics, is, ethics is, runs through our entire curriculum. Right. So uh, it, those, those, they, they have felt fine with finding that home in the, in the gen ed program uh, in addition to the as long as they like the like the, how the courses are designed. Yes. Uh, if they don't, you got issues. Yeah, no, I think I, I think we will have some some problems with with recruiting simply because of, of the scale. Um, you know, we're we're, we're going to be offering um, depending on exactly what they, where the class size ends up, thirty or forty sections at each key study. Um, you know, so something like two hundred sections a year. Um, and, and I guess my question would have to do with scalability. Um, you know, with um, you know that you know we we want to use full time faculty. That was that's the original idea. Um, but it seems to me inevitable that at a certain point uh, we're going to be in in um, you know August or January, and we don't have enough sections, and we're going to have to add a bunch of them at the last minute. And uh, you know, uh, I mean. Uh, how do you how do you deal with issues like that uh, in, in this kind of a model? How do you compare your comment to what this gentleman just said about the uh, there being perhaps too many faculty who are who um, are being unhosed from their typical I, uh, I, diet of courses? Well, I, and, I think that in, a, in 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 particular departments, I think that may be that may be the case. Um, uh, in um, in, in English, I don't think it will be because we're also adding, we're also adding a, comp, a second comp course, um, and uh, uh, although, it, and uh, you know, and I think, and I mean, I think everyone's everyone's going to be different, but I don't, but it's it's just it's just the it's just the scale of it that is that it that is, you know, and, and you know, even having a even having a coordinator, which in, in for each course, which uh, I I'm, uh, I think. Would be a minimal thing to have, but when you have that many, when you have that many sections, um, you know, and you're recruiting faculty from all these different departments, it it, it just seems uh, potentially uh, an administrative issue to, uh, to put it out. I've been on that doorstep of the day before classes and uh, realizing that there's students who have to take the course to graduate, and you need more sections uh, and so on. A large part of my job as director was just talking to the chairs constantly, uh, you know, looking semesters down the road of, well, I can't have this person now, but, you know, on down. Did an awful lot of that. We also shared adjuncts so that uh, you were drawing on people who were experienced within the department, not just, you know, bring, not, bringing, not in not people, just yeah. uh, bringing in uh, people, bringing uh, in people suddenly to the entire university, uh, orienting to your college and to interdisciplinary teaching. We tried to draw on, uh, on faculty uh, both full-time and part-time. But, but, you're, but you're right. Uh, any large gen ed program, you know, any, any kind of core program uh, is going to have those issues. It seems to be such a scary thing. Can you said a little louder, please? <clears throat> the change uh, from the existing gen ed to the proposed gen ed seems to be frightening. Because it's so, <clears throat> seems to be that the impact of the change will influence all the aspects of the college uh, uh, life. And there's no way really to predict how it's going to turn out. So there's a lot of 
uncertainty seems uh, associated with the process, and that's scary. I think that, that, that cuts two ways. Uh, yes, there are, yes, there are risks, and my, my next slide uh, here was, there are also some surprising rewards uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. I don't want to minimize at all the risk, believe me, as a director of having to staff courses, I, I, I've uh, definitely been there. On the other hand, there's some things that we wouldn't have experienced otherwise. We have seven colleges and a university smaller than yours. People don't know each other across those different areas. The business school doesn't deal with the health professions people. Uh, and yet, if you're going to talk about dealing with hunger, it would be good to have someone from health professionals talking to someone in economics. Uh, that really would help. But it wasn't happening. So we've now got faculty who were in separate kingdoms talking with each other. That was a part of the, uh, the design of the program. And I think that that has, uh, has worked well um, over the years. Stretching outside your comfort zone with the assistance of colleagues uh, that have the expertise uh, has been a pleasant surprise. A lot of us in this profession uh, have been at it a while and can uh, still get a kick out of learning something that's that stretches, in, stretches you in a really uh, new way. And it's invigorated a lot of faculty who were just teaching the same intro courses over and over and over and over. How many times can I do, uh, you know, American history, the same course? Well, yes, you change it. But this changed us up in ways that we hadn't anticipated uh, that were really uh, quite wonderful. And when we come back to our own discipline, we teach better than we did before. I know in teaching a Brit Lit survey, I do a lot better uh, now that I know a bit more of the history and philosophy. I still have a ton to learn. But now that I can uh, make connections across the arts, know a little bit more about what's going on from the colleagues that I've worked with, I do my home discipline better. Uh, the science and art course I've referred to, the chemist now routinely comes and guests in the art school. The painter now routinely guests in the chemist's class. They say to each other, we've bonded. <laughs> we like each other. Completely different languages and different backgrounds, but they're having a ball working together. When I was directing the program, I'd say to the people, you guys want to you know, try something new next semester? They said, no, no, we like each other. We're having fun. Actually, the president of our university uh, team teaches with uh, the chair of the faculty senate. And they've been doing this for years in a Discovering America course. And they use the city of Hartford as their laboratory to look at issues of uh, American history. It helps the president travel, because he's got someone to cover his class when he's gone also. Uh, but uh, they've had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, we have emeriti faculty across the university from all of our seven colleges who retire and want to come back and teach a course or two to stay active and engaged. And they teach in this program which to me is a nice testimony that uh, is an unanticipated benefit, shall we say, that uh, they could come back and teach in their safe department that they've been housed in for an entire career. But when they retire, they come back, and this is where, this is where, they, where they are. I could uh, name a large number of our faculty who are uh, emeriti now coming back. And I guess they count as adjuncts, and so therefore we're a little too high adjuncted, but a lot of those folks are, are uh, former department chairs who are now coming back and new content. But it's new pedagogy. It's new scholarship, and it's new service, too. A lot of our faculty will guest in each other's courses. No honorarium, but just because they've worked together in course planning, they see where, oh, I'd love it if the state trooper would come into my class. I'm a legal studies expert. If the state trooper comes in and says how this plays out, wow, that'll wake them up. Uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful, and it hasn't taken a lot of money uh, to sustain it, uh, to have those kinds of. Uh, so. A piece of uh, making this happen also for faculty would be that promotion, I was mentioning to Deborah, promotion and tenure guidelines could be revised or made more explicit that this is service to the university. If you're guesting in someone else's class, if you're participating in course development, this counts. It's not just disciplinary teaching scholarship service, but that anything you do for this program cuts across all those categories in ways that can, can count uh, when it comes to the traditional reward systems that are departmental and will remain so. The power structures remain departmental. So anything that goes outside of university power structures, by definition, of course, risky, risky. Uh, and, and with students uh, here, uh, we get, get, to, get to our uh, discussion quickly. Uh, the the uh, Concerns for students don't go away either. They figure it'll be three times as hard, and you've already heard me say we put too much into the courses, so sometimes it is. Uh, but you can uh, address that. 
I love this one though. Our course evaluations at the beginning says, oh, our uh, problems with the course, the faculty didn't get along, uh, brings them into a, a model of knowledge as negotiated, uh, knowledge as connected, and they see that in the delivery of, of the course. The rewards, uh, I want to get to an activity here. I've talked talk long enough, so I'll, I'll fly through here. There's books, uh, books upon books and article upon article that'll tell you what students will gain. Um, it's huge. Knowledge is interconnected, and it's not in opposition to the disciplines. To me, getting a program like this through is to say it's not opposition, but building on the disciplines, and if you do it well, it leads the students out in the courses that they might not have taken otherwise. My art historian draws students into her classes who would never have come to her classes just because she's good. <laughs> they talk to her in the gen ed class, like her, and then go take an advanced course in art history. They would never have dreamed of doing that. So uh, it can feed into, it can be a feeder uh, as opposed to a competitor. Uh, I used to read box loads because we were nervous about this kind of a risk. Box loads of evaluation. What I loved about required courses was this comment uh, that I kept seeing over and over again. And I'm thinking, Gen Ed? Required Gen Ed? Good God. <laughs> uh, the fact that students would actually say that uh, it should be, uh, this particular iteration of it would be a good requirement that everybody should take a course on epidemics and AIDS or urban arts, say, uh, said to me that, that it was worth the risks. Um, we can do some questions at this point, or I, I would love to take you through a little bit of that backward design model of what's an objective that you could envision in a course, and how would you coach students to uh, achieve that in an integrative way. Any immediate questions uh, that you want to, before we head into the activity, that you would like us to, to stop with? Uh, as you were uh, talking about this, I was struck by the fact that you seem to bring up the experience, some kind of an experiential uh, component as a part of almost every example that you talked about. So can you elaborate a little bit about that experiential piece being uh, linked to the integration? A lot of directions that that comment uh, could go. Uh, that piece of our logo on active learning is something that I'm assuming that you're aiming a square at uh, for yours also. So getting students to do something outside the classroom has been a central piece of most of these courses. And then getting the students to come back and reflect on what they've experienced through the lenses of multiple disciplines has been key. Uh, for example, we have an educational Main Street program where students would tutor in the schools and then come back and reflect on what they've experienced in light of what they're learning from sociological lenses, psychological lenses, and so on. So there's been a, we've done, done a lot of workshops on that. Uh, it's not a hard and fast requirement, but it's uh, when course proposals come through, we do insist that they not be straight lecture discussion classes, that there be some kind of uh, active learning there. So course specific, I guess, is my comment. That's the joy of getting the faculty together in the small groups. What kind of activity is going to allow students to get that experiential basis that they're going to view through those multiple lenses? There's a lot more to say. I got an article on the web, my website that gives a lot of exam more examples of it, but, uh, but it's huge. Uh, then the students see that experience isn't neat, nice and neat in boxes like disciplines are. When they see that, it makes the self with the gen ed program a lot easier. Uh, they see that if you're going to understand that particular problem you need. You could tell them that. See, we but when they see it, it's different. See, we've got two principles, uh, as we explicated from the beginning, uh, from among the six. But seeing this kind of helps one to link them. In other words, what seems uh, to be happening that the principle of integration is intrinsically linked to the principle of experiential. Right, right, right. If you look at the uh, definitions of integration, interdisciplinarity is one kind of integration. So you're also wanting integration across academia and the student's own experience. So interdisciplinarity is one kind of integration that you want. You want also that academics and, uh, and experience uh, linkage. So inter interdisciplinarity as a species of integrative thinking, I guess, is probably the easiest way to, uh, to, to see those. Yes. Uh, uh, we are designing a, a course uh, for keys, uh, human behavior keystone course. Uh, it's called uh, hunger and consumption. So I just want to sum up 
you know, your opinion of if we are going the uh, right direction. Is you are talking about the you know integration and then uh, uh, still not uh, do not lose the each uh, the disciplinary lens. Right. Uh, so, for example, what we are doing, we are designing the. Uh, uh, topics for each week and the readings for each week. So we were thinking like for the first two weeks, uh, first first one, for example, is the poverty uh, in the world. So the, in this uh, week, we're going to uh, ask the student to focus on political and uh, social perspective of uh, hunger. And then, then the second week, we call it the stomach and the mind. That would come to, from a psycho psychological and uh, uh, health and then the remaining weeks, we're going to divide them uh, into uh, uh, divide divide them divide them uh, according to the topics. But then uh, these weeks will be mixed readings from different disciplines. Is this a, what, what? What do you think? You know, is it right in the direction? I'm, I'm not sure. So. More, more than one way to work. Uh, certainly, we st we st when I started with the course that I teach myself and where I've seen a lot of teams start, we want to cl include these topics, these readings, uh, this kind of general progression, and so on. Uh, I, I would suggest we actually, uh, with, with your prompt, uh, try a little bit of the opposite direction. This is the backward design direction of instead of starting with, let's start with these issues and these readings and build week by week by week to week and see where we end up. Uh, I'd propose that you take uh, uh, see maybe five or ten minutes uh, at your tables and if you're by yourself uh, join so you end up saying threes, two or three there. Uh, try it this way uh, to apply what, you, what we've talked about today of aiming not at juxtapositional learning only but at integrative learning and we'll do this as an add-on not an instead of but an add-on to where you're already working beautifully. Uh, drawing on the expertise and within, this will only work by the way if you can do one really fast. So your table, for example, just take hunger and run with it for now, because if we take a long time on one, uh, this isn't a half a day workshop. But deciding the topic for a Keystone course, uh, you can select one that you're already working on, or one that you know about, or invent one uh, for the moment. But a specific one, not, not a big generic, but a very specific focus. Uh, I was typing here uh, before coming in, and obviously didn't run a spell check on what I just typed uh, when I came, but sorry about the typo. Uh, how would you recognize if you design here an ob objective for that specific course, how would you recognize if a student achieved that? Now, the objective, not a, not a disciplinary objective, but an objective across disciplines. How would you know it when you see it? What's one assignment that could show that kind of integrative thinking, that kind of interdisciplinary thinking that draws on disciplines and integrates their insights? Back to our definition. And then, the final step here, what would be a couple of teaching and learning activities that would prepare students to do well on that assignment? In other words, you're backing up from in what, ki what kind of integration do I expect to see at the end of the class? How would I know it when I saw it? Don't just wish the student good luck and hope that something emerges. <laughs> what kind of thinking do I expect to see at the end? And then how, how could I prepare? What would I, what would I do? What would the students do to get to it? Make sense enough to give it a go for a couple of minutes? Uh, try at your tables. Uh, again, number one really fast because the, the two and three are the uh, challenges here. I'd love to try to have the groups hear a little bit of what's going on. So if you could wrap it up in a minute or so, uh, we'll at least have a, a quick uh, come back together as a group to see a little bit of the wisdom of the tables here of applying some of this. Thank you. With apologies for interrupting you, I know that some of you have classes to get to coming up, and if you were doing this in your own classroom, you'd give a civilized amount of time to do it instead of just getting the sparks going and then cutting you off in the middle. Uh, my apologies for that, but I do hear some good thinking going on at the tables. Is there a particular table that wants to go first? I'd love to hear just briefly from the tables what topic, what was the objective you started with? How would you know it when you see it if the student isn't just juxtaposing and gluing it all together, but is actually thinking it through and drawing some fruitful connections? How would you see it? And if you want to see that, how would you get there? Well, I mean, I, we, we were throwing out topics, and mine was the notion of where I'm part of the thing that's trying to do uh, interdisciplinary keystone course arts of expression. And uh, the topic that I thought would have been interesting is, is around protest, because protest as a form of expression 
crosses all of the various arts and disciplines, and particularly of interest of, of the notion of a hidden protest. I, in examples of that through allegory, and I was thinking of the day the earth stood still, and that was a commentary on the, um, the McCarthy blacklist on Hollywood and things like that. And so the objective would to have students recognize forms of protest or hidden protests in, in these various forms of expression, Love but then also have students have this opportunity to create their own pieces of hidden protest through multimedia projects or sculpture or characters and screenplays and things like that. So what kind of, the, 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 where, where that goes is uh, hoping that it will happen uh, doesn't usually please us with the, uh, as we know in our own disciplines where the term paper, uh, people just groan and throw up their hands when it isn't good. We know that you need to create the steps. Any, any ideas on steps that would help students to be able to do that well, uh, things that you would do or things that you would have them do? I don't really get to that. Yeah. That was yeah, the, that's the next step. would be by studying examples and reflecting on, the exam on example first. And then, so they're introduced to potential tools, you know, um, before they have to go out and, and generate their own ideas for an example, you know, and creation. I mean, that's off the top of my head. Tons of our courses, by the way, use guided journals so that the students are just writing constantly and putting this beside that and how do you see this in the light of that and uh, doing just lots and lots of short writing. So together, thank you. It'll be interesting if that comes to fruition. I'd love to see it happen. Right. <laughs> uh, we actually uh, drew naturally coming from psychology, from nursing and social work. Uh, we can drew it up the topic of, of motherhood. Uh, and, uh, and immediately established our own disciplinary perspectives, but then differed, I think, a little bit in terms of, uh, or, or stalled when it came to an objective, when we tried to do an, inter an interdisciplinary uh, objective. Seems to be, uh, you had the, uh, this, can you just say? <laughs> we sort of came up with, um that the student would be able to synthesize the knowledge of psych, social work, and nursing theory as they think critically when caring for families. I, I didn't hear the end, sorry. That the student would be able to synthesize knowledge of psych, social work, and nursing theory as they think critically when caring for families because our, our discussion actually centered around motherhood and um, how students view motherhood and how um, we could use all three disciplines to help the students to overcome that because motherhood um, is sometimes seen as being the, the what was the term you use? Uh, Just blameless. Mothers are, right. are, are seen it's blameless, and so. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and the focus also on mother doesn't always know best. <laughs> because here we are, we, we may have. Um, a mother who actually abuses her child because she lacks certain knowledge. Um, and so, you know, we brought in the whole um, thing about using all three disciplines, disciplines to teach our students so that, you know, they would arrive at that. So but that's how we were looking at it. And then, of course, we would have to move backwards in terms of dealing with how we would do that. No, that, what would you like to see uh, at yeah. the end that would show that the student actually was able to bring those yeah. things together? That's the... Yeah. And that's, uh, where we're, that's where we kind of... But, but what we found, though, is it's, it's hard working together, even though we're so closely related. <laughs> All social scientists there. Right, in that it's still hard working together. And, it's you know, a challenge to separate from the discipline, and it seems it's going to be a challenge, because mm -hmm. when you embed in the course objective a reference to the discipline, you already defy the purpose. Right. Uh, well, say that again? It seems like when we uh, have embedded the references to the disciplines in the objective, that in itself defied the notion of integration. But if you want students to see the complexity of the problems, in other words, the problem, we so often stereotype, and oh, well, that mother, she just X, Y, Z. Uh, you're trying to get the students beyond simple explanations to see the complexity but of it. So, so saying that looking at it through these different lenses will help you to understand 
a complexity that you didn't see before. Yeah, that can use the disciplines. We want to attempt to develop like a broader view on this, like a notion of deconstructing uh, the idea of a motherhood is interdisciplinary, and there is no reference to a specific discipline in it. You know what I'm saying? I do. Okay. But I don't think you need to be worry about bringing in references to the okay. disciplines along the way. I would not, I would not uh, have that uh, reservation uh, along the way. You're going to use those lenses to help the students right. see more. Right. Um, so. um, we, we, we were uh, talking about, um, we started talking about issues of uh, hunger and consumption and um, the, I mean, in this case, it it, uh, it didn't correspond to any particular actual fig. Because we have uh, you know, English and sociology. The actual fig would be sociology and psychology and what else? Political science. Um, and so then we sort we sort of I guess we sort of um, segue into talking about that. Um, uh, but I, I guess the one thing that we uh, could contribute is that we were we were sort of thinking um, of, about sort of the issue of uh, how do you get beyond uh, disciplinarity, uh, really, you know, and just sort of um, a series of, of of disciplinary perspectives. And we we thought that the the only way you can do that is to have the topic of the course be uh, beyond your control. Uh, that it has to be too big for you to uh, to just introduce with this reading or that reading, or but but that it, it you know, and that's I think where the experiential thing can, comes in, uh, where you're where where they're, they're sort of unpredictable uh, elements that are going to be brought in uh, by the students, uh, and which then they can try to make sense of. Uh, you know, using the various lenses uh, of the disciplines. Yeah. The folks who are interdisciplinary theorists often talk about common ground. You're looking at an issue through multiple perspectives, but where is their common ground? If you're going to have a proposal to deal with this problem, how do you find common ground? Yes. So in other words, back to my slide on finding a common vocabulary, which is one way to do it, some kind of a common language so that we can talk to each other. You were saying it's hard to even talk. Do we have a common vocabulary in any way, or are we going to have to understand each other's separate vocabularies? Then beyond terms, it's you know where is there common ground? If you have competing perspectives on this, uh, if we're going to have to propose something, are we going to track our students in the Hartford schools according to levels or untrack them? Different perspectives, different disciplines see that issue differently. There are economic uh, dimensions to tracking students into. You, know, you, you all know this uh, already. Where is there common ground among those different perspectives to deal with the issue? So that, that search for common ground is some of the language that I often hear for uh, addressing that. I don't, want, I don't want to talk too much and We're, leave you uh, out here. I'm working on a faculty and group, group for um, World and U.S. History, and um, Tay is one of my colleagues on that group. And one of the titles for the courses that we're looking at is Revolutions in World and U.S. History. So for this particular exercise, we identified a goal as wanting our students to recognize the multiple sources of conflict, the complexity and the origins of revolution. And the way we would get them to examine this would be to um, have assignments about diverse revolutions in world history, but have the class in groups, and each group would have to investigate uh, origins of a specific revolution looking at both printed and visual sources for political, social, economic, religious, cultural, racial, historical issues. And then each group would present their findings about the specific revolution. And then a final project would be for students, I think individually, to synthesize the evidence from all the different groups to come up with a broad understanding of um, the origins of revolution by analyzing the various experiences. <laughs> so, just for the record, by the way, uh, the end point is going to be different depending on the topic area. In other words, for some kinds of courses, the end point may be a decision. 
when you have these competing perspectives, where do we find common ground so that we can move forward to get something done? In others, the end point may be an understanding of complexity. Mm -hmm. So you're not trying to move into to a synthesis on which you can act with a unified plan, like a gen ed revision, <laughs> but the, the uh, yeah. end point of in the humanities and, and other disciplines as well, uh, but history where you are, it's an understanding of the complexity of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a historian. I think history, by definition, is interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding of it. Fair enough. That was nice, though, because that was a nice modeling of the kind of conversations we have to foment to sort of mm -hmm. move uh, course design along. Right. It's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, we very quickly just also realized that we could take what we were, you know, in the very early stages of planning, take it outside the classroom and take this notion of mothering into homeless shelters um, for young mothers who, you know, um, or girls in high school. Um, so, you know, students <coughs> take what they've learned. And of course, a, a danger with the short-term experiences within a semester is that it reinforces instead of breaks down stereotypes. So sure. one, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can frame the experience with questions like, what are the sources of strength? Not, not, not what are the problems oh, sure. <laughs> that you see, what are all the many problems that this person has, but what are the sources of strength on, this per, on which this person is able to rely so that the way you frame the question yeah. can be interdisciplinary, but not in the direction that will reinforce stereotypes based on a very short foray into a community that is not their own, which is always what worries me when I send students out <laughs> tutoring short term. I want them to break down the stereotypes and not to reinforce, oh, these poor, these poor folks. I think a real challenge is um, getting uh, assignments together for students in terms of readings, because unlike our usual disciplinary gen ed courses where you have a textbook, there's no textbook for this. Mm -hmm. So I think you mentioned at one point, once these things are well underway, creating custom readers. A lot of us have, a yeah. lot of the courses have it's, done that because yeah. there's no book that does no, all that you want, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. want it to do, so. Um, yeah. yeah. But to, to get that together is not something one person can do on their own in their spare time. And shouldn't do because you yeah. don't want to be, uh, you know, with your disciplinary yeah. hegemony, yeah. you don't want to be you know, marching across the, uh, somebody else's fields, uh, uh, trampling across their That's fields. Right. You want to have, you know, what, what would you suggest as, as readings that are important in your discipline? Yes. We had an experience with the custom books uh, in some of the social work courses. And since social work is interdisciplinary by definition, it was easy to do one where we had readings uh, from sociology, from political science, from economy, so on. And they're horrible. They're really horrible. It's uh, because the readings are disciplinary. And, 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 and when you make the whole bulk of the reading material uh, the, uh, just a juxtaposition of the disciplines, it doesn't seem to work. On the other hand, when you do an interdisciplinary course, maybe there is an opportunity to find another ground, like a common ground, the one you, and that could be literature, that could be art, that could be anything else, yet you would still have the disciplinary uh, sources, but only in support of the common source. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, could be a novel that drives the whole course on on uh, the motherhood, and yet you do have interdisciplinary yeah. course uh, uh, readings, which feed into our understanding of the novel. Yeah. There's so much yet to be yet to be said here. I know I know some things that I, I have left out. I didn't you know, it, to talk about team teaching itself is is, a, is an entire workshop of of its own. And so I've tried to frame my comments. Whether or not you team teach, these are some questions to ask. But if you decide to go the route of a lot of team teaching, I would definitely recommend someone who to talk to you. Like arranged marriages, some of them work out better than the ones born of common of common passion. But some of them, the best ones, don't last, and so on. There's a, there's a whole uh, whole uh, day on uh, team teaching. Uh, you may have some major issues that you were hoping uh, that we would address here today that we haven't touched on uh, at all. Uh, would love to have you let Deborah know, let me know. I, I'm sure with uh, this uh, you know, wonderful array of faculty here that there's a you know, tip of an iceberg of things that were on your minds and, uh, and no, no hour would be sufficient. So if it at least is provocative enough to get some people uh, uh, talking, uh, that's uh, a good uh, first step. I'm delighted to have a chance to at least uh, for this uh, short uh, 
few moments to share the time with you. And uh, I have some uh, business cards and a website if you want to uh, be in any kind of follow-up touch uh, to continue the association of our two schools. Uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to share that further with you. But thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.